So welcome to today's webinar entitled How Comfort and Control Works in Practice. Um, we're so pleased that you can join us. My name is Kim Sanders and I'm the president of Ukuru Systems. Um, before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping issues. Um, we've taken a screenshot and shown you an example here of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right hand corner. You're listening in, you, if you're listening and using your computer's um, speaker system by default, that's fine. If you would prefer to join using the phone, you can just select telephone in the audio pane and dial in with the, the information that is displayed. We are eager for this to be as interactive as possible. You will have the opportunity to, to submit text questions to today's um, presenters by typing your questions in the questions pane on the control panel. Uh, you can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect those and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. In addition, we welcome you to join us throughout the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag, hashtag starts with you. A few other items we want to make you aware of. Um, for those of you who need a certificate or continuing education credit for this discussion, we can make that available to you upon request. Um, in addition, a copy of the presentation will be distributed in the next few days. Uh, we're also recording the conversation and we'll post that on our website later this week. So, to get started, information about um, how we're going to do all of this for you. Um, I'm really pleased to have two panelists join us today who really embody a philosophy of comfort versus control in their daily lives, providing care to a broad range of populations. Uh, we have Jennifer Burns uh, from Lemoyne School Day Treatment at Alta Point Health System, which is Alabama's largest regional community behavioral health provider. We're also very lucky to have Veronica Federcaroni, uh, CEO of Autism Services in upstate New York. Just to remind folks that the format for today's discussion will be several rounds of questions and answers with our panel. We also have time to respond to questions um, at the end altogether. Before we begin, though, um, let's talk a little bit about how we define the term comfort versus control. Um, you know, th this is a term that we developed here at our parent organization, Grafton Integrated Health Network, um, and one that we employ every day uh, in the work that we do. And basically, what this means to us is that it encompasses our belief that people inherently want to do well and those with disabilities are no exception. When we see an individual with a disability struggling, it is our responsibility to figure out the why and to teach the skills necessary for success. So we want to make sure um, that, that folks understand that when we talk about comfort versus control, we, we talk about things like the golden rule and treating people the way we want to be treated. And again, when we talk about it, the, the pressure and the responsibility being on our shoulders, we're talking about sort of the, the professionals or the, the adults in the room. Um, we see that it is, it is our role to help people who are struggling and to figure out uh, what we can do different to help them. Some key elements of comfort versus control include using a trauma-informed approach, creating a supportive care, uh, caregiving environment sensitive, sensitive to the client's experiences um, in the past regarding violence and victimization, that we're helping individuals thrive in the least restrictive environment consistent with, with achieving the best outcome for them, and achieving the greatest impact during the shortest possible length of stay for each client um, that is served. So with that in mind, why don't we just go ahead, um, talk to our panelists, and to start, um, Jennifer, if you could start us off and maybe talk a little bit about the population that your organization works with. Of course. 
Um, I'm the coordinator for our Lemoyne School within Alta Point Health Systems. Um, it's a day treatment that serves ages kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, our students must be enrolled in Mobile County Public School, have an IQ of at least 70 or higher, and they must receive special education, so they must have an IEP. Um, students that we serve, they typically have the type of behaviors of attention seeking, uh, per poor personal boundaries, um, poor social skills, aggressive, temper tantrums, hyperactive, and defiant. So those are type of the, the type of behaviors that we see within my building. Um, within Bay Point, we also have a residential facility and acute hospital care that serves ages 5 through 18. Terrific. Thank you. Um, Veronica, what is the population of the organization that uh, you work, work with? Well, we uh, serve both children and adults with a primary diagnosis of autism. Uh, we have uh, several programs. We have a, a certified New York State certified education program for kids 5 through 21 on the autism spectrum. Um, we have an after school program and a vacation camp that we hold uh, because we know that it's very difficult for our children to be away from school. So during uh, break time, we hold a camp if, uh, during that time. Um, and then we have adult services uh, after age 21. They can go into, uh, we have some site-based day services for people who are a little bit more in need of extra support. And then we have some more community-based uh, day hub without walls, what it's referred to, where they're more community-bound, um, involved in community activities or volunteer work or seeking employment. Um, we also have a residential program, so we have 13 uh, residences that uh, are in the surrounding areas, a Saturday program, we work with social skills for children and adults, uh, respite for our families, um, we have an in-home behavior support. We tend to take uh, children and adults who are at the uh, very needy end of the spectrum, so those kids uh, that really don't make it um, uh, in district or in um, an environment that doesn't provide enough support for them. And we have Medicaid service coordination um, and employment services. Okay, thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about each of your journeys um, to reduce the use of restraint and seclusion. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to start us off there and share a little bit about Alta Point's experience? Yeah, sure. Um, well, before Ukuru was introduced to the organization, we aim to educate the staff to the best of our ability through ongoing trainings within the facility and through outside agencies. Um, before I actually started with Alta Point, I worked as a therapist with child abuse victims. So I've had a lot of exposure to the effects of trauma on an individual. Um, based off of my experience, I've understood the importance of having a trauma-informed approach. So when I transitioned to this position, I immediately felt like there was a lack of knowledge. Um, I contacted one of my old coworkers who worked with the agency that I, I used to work with as the coordinator for the, the right crisis center. And so she organized a training session for my staff within the Lemoyne School, it was a full day of hands-on training that opened up their perspective to the long-term effects of trauma and how trauma can impact behavior. Um, although the training filled a need that was necessary to work with our, work with our students, you know, it was only temporary. Um, we had staff move on to other positions. We had new hires and then other staff in the facility assisting us who had not received the same training that I just put my staff through. Um, so the only way to be, to be successful, in my opinion, is to be consistent. And unfortunately, at that time, it just it wasn't possible. Um, it wasn't until Grafton came to visit that I, I saw a light at the end of the tunnel. Although Grafton was speaking my language, surely like, not everybody was really buying it at that time. OK, and we definitely want to hear more about, about some of that journey um, as we go on. but. Um, Veronica, um, what have the efforts to minimize uh, restraint and seclusion at uh, Autism Services been like? Well, I mean, uh, 
Kim, I started my career working in institutions back in back in 1970. So um, I've seen uh, huge transitions over uh, the course of 46 years. Um, uh, the only kind of training that um, we received going into institutions was uh, because it was a medical model run by psychiatrists was the use of um, heavy doses of medication and how to put on a camisole or a straitjacket as people refer to them. Mm -hmm. um, as the state became more and more um, uh, introduced to other treatments, um, you, we learned um, curriculums that you that used um, restraints uh, primarily, um, not as restrictive as the camisole and medications, but nonetheless, um, they uh, tried to uh, give us a curriculum that had sort of a proactive approach to it. But along with that came 40 different physical restraints or holds. Uh, and we in New York State were all, if you were working for the state or a private agency, you were mandated to master all 40 restraints. Um, never felt right to me personally, uh, just putting my hands on uh, people. So um, then I, I decided I was going to uh, look for a new model. And um, I reached out to some icons in the industry, in the autism industry, um, Brenda Smith-Miles and Ruth Asty and Barry Grossman, and they introduced me to the Ziggurat model. And, and again, it was a research-centered system that capitalized on strengths and interests in order to address underlying um, challenges. Our focus had always been on what are the underlying causes for um, the behaviors that they were exhibiting. And uh, we put a lot of effort into that. And then um, I attended a conference, an ASA conference, in around 2008, or maybe before that, when I actually attended a workshop that you held, Kim, and you uh, introduced the um, notion of sort of a hands-off hands approach within your organization, that um, you were moving away from, or your CEO wanted you to move, move away from the use of restraints or putting hands on people or and no more seclusion. Um, and so I came back and sort of grouped, uh, got my group together and talked about it because, again, it was something that was very appealing to me. And we did a conference call with you folks. And from there, we started uh, our own, um, we called it API, Alternatives to Personal Intervention. And Personal interventions was just another word for restraints. Um, so we were looking uh, to introduce supportive blocking techniques that you, you know, put out there for us. Um, and then, you know, in 2016, uh, we started to see an increase in injuries again to staff, high turnover, um, and and workers' comp, of course, was on on the increase. And so I I reached out to Grafton once again, and Kim, you personally, to find out how you guys were doing. And that's when the notion of trauma-informed care came up, a term I had never heard before, uh, and, and a term that we never spoke in our industry. So um, from that point on, I, uh, I brought someone in, actually, from the University of Buffalo to speak to us on trauma-informed care, and um, then uh, sort of got put into motion the uh, uh, you guys coming out to do the train the trainer and uh, so today uh, we are very happy to be um, a user of Ucaro. Yeah, actually, Veronica, I, I remember the first the first time we met, um, and I think from the beginning when we first met, there was just something that was clicking as we both had sort of been through this this whole process of of coming into the field years ago and feeling like basically what our training was focusing on was how to restrain. Um, but it, I, I think that, you know, we, we both felt like that just not, did not feel right to us. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, I mean, the first time I had to use a, a physical intervention, um, a restraint. It was extremely emotional, and I reached out to the the person who was my instructor and said, "Just this just does not feel right. It doesn't feel good to me." And he responded with, 
Well, that's how you should feel. You should feel emotional about it. You should not be okay about touching people. Um, he said, so you have to learn about the people and how to prevent those kinds of things and um, see what triggers those events so that you can sort of build a more supportive environment than um, the use of restraints. Absolutely. Veronica, did you want to say anything more about the model or the the which one? The the Ziggurat um, model. Well the Ziggurat Ziggurat, you know, I, I was very impressed with Ziggurat. Um I think it might have been at the same conference that I met you at. Um mm -hmm. I just liked the name, so I went to the workshop and learned that um the what they were using in this model was really nothing different than what we had been using right along in terms of really trying to find the underlying causes of behavior, challenging behavior. But they had a structure to it um, and it had a name. And I think, you know, for most uh, private organizations, um, at least I know locally, they like to say that they, they um, have a particular model that they use when working with people. So, um, I brought, I came back with the Ziggurat model on, as you can see, it's, um, uh, it, it, it talks about all the things we typically look at when we're trying to analyze behaviors, you know, the, the biological, the physical and biological sensory and all this, all the stuff that we always have done over the years. Um, and uh, again, the focus on the underlying causes and what can we do um, to minimize behaviors. But, um, and, and it was great, but, um, we still had to resort to uh, physical interventions for people who were, um, you know, had extreme challenges around uh, self-injurious behavior or aggression. Sure. Okay, so let's let's um, talk a little bit about probably one of the things that sometimes is the most difficult, and that's changing the culture. Um, so, Veronica, why don't you start and talk a little bit about how did you get your, your employees to buy into the concept of comfort versus control? Well, as I said, um, for us the culture shift moved from a focus of, uh, especially related to, because we work only with autism, um, and historically the way people worked with people with autism was to try to change their behavior, you know. Um, and. Uh, I became more and more aware of the fact that there were some things we simply could not change. And so I was sending that message that we need to, needed to shift from a focus of changing autism um, by always researching the underlying causes to ceasing the focus more on underlying causes and instead accepting and supporting autism and how it played out in, in all environments and then giving more control back to our folks while adapting the environment to meet their challenges. Um, and of course, you know, with people getting injured all the time, we, we had an extreme turnover in staff due to um, staff injuries because of the population. Um, people uh, started to buy into it just uh, with the fact that we weren't going to um, try and change their behaviors, but accept them, support them, and try to introduce more things that are sort of meeting their interests versus their needs. We recognized they had a lot of needs, a lot of deficit areas, but we started to focus on what did they really enjoy, what did they like, what were their interests, and try to monopolize on their interests. And as we tried to, tried to do that, some of the challenging behaviors started to dissipate. But prior, uh, you know, prior to that, every approach was about control and creating power struggles which resulted in, you know, uh, physical interventions and restraints. Um, and it just sort of uh, um, exacerbated the trauma. Every time I kept thinking, once I heard about trauma-informed care uh, and the fact that we don't know what our children come to us with from a home environment where parents are dealing with kids who are nonverbal, extreme behaviors, um, and, and just for lack of knowledge for families, we don't know what kind of trauma they bring with them. And then, you know, couple that with us putting our hands all over them made me think about the fact that all we're doing is increasing um, more trauma to them in their lives. So um, the staff were, you know, 
when, once we started to talk, to talk about the trauma-informed care, uh, they were really excited about that. So uh, we had an agency-wide um, focus on recruitment and retention. We had to. Uh, and, in the, and, um, and for them to hear that we wanted to decrease staff injuries um, uh, was, of course, important to them. Um, I, all old blocking pads were removed because we were using them from our API uh, approach. We started to, to distribute tidbit flyers about the program as staff trainings occurred to keep it in the forefront of everyone's mind as we rolled it out that, you know, hands off, we do not want to touch our folks. Let's learn more about them. What do they like to do? We, uh, even with our training, we tried to make it um, very convenient for staff so we had flexible training options, even if we had to work evenings and weekends so the people could come and the trainings occurred over a three-month period. And then, of course, the, the ongoing support from the team over uh, your team, the UQRA team, every two weeks really helped. Um, we developed some social stories um, for staff to use with our kids um, uh, so because they would start to see these blockers within their environment. And we wanted our kids and adults to see that the pads were there as a support rather than a threat and to include them in the transition. Um, and we, we started to put it into their, um, their communication devices, you know. Um, that they could request the, the blockers, not that the, the, uh, the staff um, were just grab, would grab them, but that they were there for them to touch, to interact with, and be a part of this transition. So um, it was sort of giving control back to our, our folks, and we saw, saw huge changes in behavior as a result of that. That's and of course, that makes I... staff happy. When the staff are not getting injured, they're very happy people. Absolutely. So I think we have a couple slides here uh, about the social stories that your folks developed. If yeah. you wanted to talk about those a little bit. Yeah. I, I mean, for people who work with social stories, we just wanted them, we wanted the children to be aware uh, of what they, what they were and to, to know that they had some control over their, you know, their own behavior and their own environment. So we introduced the social stories, especially to kids who we knew um, might have difficulty like with transition. We know, we know what the triggers are. Transition is very difficult for our kids, so we might review the social story just before transition from you know, maybe one therapy to the next or you know, from classroom to lunchtime or from you know, uh, the end of the day onto the bus. So we always went over the social story uh, with them. That's great. I think we have another one. Here's another example. Yeah, it's just another. it's just an example of the the social score story, so that they could see what everything looked like, and there you know there was nothing to be fearful of. It wasn't we weren't using them as a threat, but for that something for them to even request if they needed it. Okay, and then I believe it's uh, just an example of how you put actually a picture of a blocking pad there on the. A communication yeah, so that device. they could request it. Yeah, if they were, if someone was feeling upset uh, or needed, rather than them them striking out at their peers or at the staff, that they could request the blocker through their communication device. And the the picture off to the right, it was a, a PEX, um, you know, so they could, if they didn't have a, a communication device, um, they could request it through um, showing their teacher or their aide um, the, the picture of the blocker through a PEC, the picture exchange communication. Cool. Thank you. So Jennifer, mm -hmm. why don't you talk to us a little bit about um, how this rolled out at AltaPoint? Sure. Um, well, as a Baypoint champion, I got to sit in with each of the groups as they were introduced to the Grafton model. And as I mentioned before, not every group was buying it, to say the least. Um, initially, most staff were either uninterested or they looked like deer in headlights. Um, restraints and seclusions were all that they knew. Most of the therapists could see the possibilities, but it was difficult for our behavioral staff. Um, however, the more our staff were educated on trauma-informed care and were able to put it into motion to implement on a daily basis, the more they bought the concept. Um, since Grafton was introduced, to our facility, we've now made trauma-informed care in Ukeru part of our new employee orientation process, which I feel has really made a huge difference 
within the Lemoyne School, we place a high importance of understanding each individual's strengths, their areas of concerns, and history of trauma. Um, we've changed our process for taking in consumers to make it more welcoming um, because we, we've got to acknowledge the fact that just coming in to our facility can be traumatic in itself. You know, these students come from a regular public school that's not a locked facility. They're able to bring their book bag and materials um, that they need throughout the day. When they come to our facility, they can't bring anything with them at all. And then they're walking in, they're being searched, and then all the doors are locked. And they're being told every day, all day, what to do. So it is a change in the environment that they're used to. And then, of course, the ones who live here, um, they're leaving their home. They're leaving what they've known. Um, and not only are they leaving a, an environment that they're comfortable with, they're, they're also learning to, to develop new habits, which changing your habits is difficult in itself. Um, with, but back to Little Moline School, we've also changed our progress notes by adding the treatment goals so that our staff members are more educated on the consumer's individual needs. Um, so the treatment goals that are, are developed with the therapist our staff are now more involved in understanding what that means and how we're measuring those goals behind closed doors during sessions so that they're able to monitor the progress all day because they're, they're the direct care staff. They're the ones that spend that really important time with them all day. So their input matters to us and it matters to the treatment of the consumers that we serve. Um, classroom staffings now include the entire treatment team so that everyone is aware of specific concerns related to the consumer's treatment. So our team involves the, the teachers, the, the behavioral staff that work directly with them, the nurse, um, the therapist, our case manager, the facilitator of academics. So it's everybody that might have a contact with the treatment of our, our students. They are all involved with this meeting, and so everybody is aware of the progress that each student is making and where our target date is for them to leave our program. Um, so I believe that combining the Grafton model with involving the staff more in the treatment process has helped reduce the number of restraints and seclusions. Our staff are more open to feedback, suggestions, and ideas, and they're more vocal in discussing a child's progress. Because if you feel like you're a part of some, someone's success story, you're more likely to, to take pride in how you perform, in my opinion. Um, implementing the Grafton model and seeing the results through data was truly, it was only half the job of getting the staff to buy into the concept. Uh, to be honest, I think it has helped having a variety of people in different positions as trainers. Because when you're a trainer, you're exposed to material repeatedly. So naturally, you're more likely to, to buy into the concept. Um, so, you know, if my coworker is a trainer and believes it can work, I'm more likely to believe it can work. Um, it makes a difference when someone who works in your shoes is presenting the material. You know, each employee could somewhat relate to at least one of the trainers. Um, our direct care staff, you know, something that we hear from them often is you just don't know how it is. You don't, you're not doing what I'm doing. You're not getting burned out like I am. I'm getting hit. I'm getting kicked. And so having someone who goes through that on a daily basis as a trainer, they're more likely to see, oh, if you can do it, if you believe in it, then I know I can at least try. And then once they try and they do it over and over again, they're able to see the difference it makes with our kids. And, and it's, it's also helping with showing a variety of techniques that can be used. You know, our staff are very creative, and sometimes I feel like they don't have um, the self-esteem, you know, needed to be able to try things that they might think of on their own. So they might not go to a therapist and ask, is this okay to try this? But during these training sessions that we have, we're seeing more staff be open with their ideas that they have thought up with what can be d used as a, a blocking tool um, or, or different ideas that are presented in our trainings, be more interested in trying them out on their own without having a, a trainer present or somebody else who's been exposed to this training more than, you know, just a new employee. Uh, the other day we used a pool noodle as a, a blocking uh, tool for someone who was head banging and it worked beautifully and now that student has their own little piece of a pool noodle that is used in the classroom or in the hallway if he, if he becomes aggressive and so we're just as a whole, we're, we're growing in our efforts to help these students with their behavior by, by exploring creativity to the best of our ability and the best of the kids' ability. 
that is wonderful to hear. That that is wonderful. But I'm sure for the folks listening, um, the million dollar question that's probably hanging out there is, okay, so is it really working? Like you may feel that it's working, but how do we know if it's really working? So Veronica, do you want to tackle that first? Sure. Um, well, let me let me um, mirror what Jennifer said about you know we do include the uh, training for Ucaro in our orientation, and we are a pretty data-driven agency. We're collecting data continuously, and um, anytime we use any kind of um, restraints um, or uh, use the, the use of blockers, um, it's written up in a um, it's written up in a report. And our positive behavior support professionals are monitoring the data continuously. Um, and uh, and you know uh, when we look at the data now, um, that's what we have to go on. We have to go on uh, the data. And what it's looking like right now is that um, since the introduction to Ucaro, we have seen staff injuries um, continue to de decline. Um, especially as we learned about trauma-informed care and uh, the fact that putting our hands on um, kids or adults could, could only lead to um, a, a worse situation for them. Um, overall, the number of injuries have decreased by about 130 in 2016. Um, Aggression-related injuries in 2016 decreased by 143 from 2015. Um, these are the staff injuries. Uh, we had 14 less workers' comp claims in 2016 from 2015, um, and our workers' compensation losses are trending around 60% lower than in the past. And you can see that by uh, the data that's up there now. <laughs> um, yeah, and then you and, can see and the, the staff trend. injuries. Yeah, the staff injuries. Um, you'll see that when we introduce the trauma-informed care, um, the, the injuries started to reduce. And then Ucaro came in, trainers were brought in. We had a little bit of a spike, um, uh, you'll see. And uh, that was because we had a, um, a pretty significant uh, turnover, and one of our folks had, was having a very difficult time. So that's that's it's not indicative of large numbers of people, but um, one person having a lot of concerns. Mm -hmm. um, okay. If you go to, yeah, the blocking, um, which, you know, the, if there's, um, if you're blocking, as you, you can see, when you're using the blocking is increasing, that tells me that uh, reset restraints are reducing, uh, are uh, being minimally used. So um, this increase in the use of blocking since 2015 um, occurred mostly after the introduction of the trauma-informed care to the agency. And then the, um, uh, this shows, uh, again, uh, this is our, are the intermediate uh, physical interventions, and these are the interventions that I told you about, the 40 different interventions that we uh, are mandated to use through uh, the use of SCIP, Strategies for Crisis Intervention and Prevention. Um, they are not the most restrictive ones, but you can see that once we introduce the blocking, the, um, the, the decrease in the intermediate uh, physical interventions, pretty significant. And then the, um, the, the last bit is, you know, where our um, most restrictive physical interventions um, uh, which include you know, some pretty restrictive techniques, including, you know, three or four person supines, um, uh, and you can see the the, the data showing that um, since the introduction of uh, Ukiru, uh, we've had a significant reduction. We did, the data right. speaks for the success of the program, really. Yeah, that, that is amazing. Uh, that, that's amazing data that you're sharing there, Veronica. All right, Jennifer, mm -hmm. so tell us about AltaPoint. Well, your question was, is it working? And absolutely. I mean, the data speaks for itself. Overall, our restraints and seclusion numbers have decreased, and our, our number of employee injuries have decreased. I mean, there are still months that we'll see an increase in numbers due to 
the staff shortage or we have turnover and the new employees are coming in and so they have to receive the training and and, and go through the whole process. Um, and we have changes in seasons. You know, our students are, within the day treatment, they're here like a regular school. So anytime there's a spring break or a Christmas break, they, they'll go home. Um, or even on weekends, they go home. And so if we have parents who are inconsistent with providing medication or going along with our treatment goals, then when we see that student return, we might have an increase in behavior due to those breaks. But of course, we try to have the students come as regularly as possible, even during those breaks. For instance, um, I know she was talking about having camps. We offer a, a really big summer camp. Um, and so that helps with that break, that gap between the school years. Um, but, you know, as Veronica said, we, we too have gone through periods where our numbers have increased uh, due to maybe one or two consumers who, you know, they're, they're having a really difficult time in their life and, and they're not understanding what we're trying to do with them or, or really getting, understanding the program. Um, and so this might not be the best place for them, but during that time period, our numbers have increase and so then we might refer out to our hospital program um, for a, you know to look at the medications or to our residential placement but that we have had our numbers go up for those circumstances but it's nowhere close to how it used to be to be honest um, as mentioned before it's also helped develop our team approach in working with the consumers within Lemoyne School our staff no longer feel like they're babysitters they're part of a treatment team and have a better understanding of the therapeutic process as a whole. The Grafton model didn't just change our approach to handling consumers in crisis, it changed our approach to treatment as a whole. Uh, so, okay, so Jennifer, what we have up here on the screen right now is the Lemoyne School, so you can see for restraint and seclusion there, but do you want to talk us through a couple of the other ones here? Sure, so that was back in 2014, 2015, and then this is um, the next slide as our most recent Back in 2014, 2015, I'm sorry, if you could go back one, um, sure. you can see that in January, December, January, that's when we started talking about Grafton. That's when I think y'all first came and did mm -hmm. your, your introduction. Um, and so you can see how much our numbers decreased over time throughout the summer. Um, if you go to the next one, this is our most recent. And so the previous screen showed that our numbers were a lot higher than 25. And on this report, we don't have any, any months that we went over 25 restraints. So that's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. Right. And what do we have here? That's our seclusion that's number. Seclusion. Mm -hmm. And so the most that we've had in a month was, was six. Right, where before you were having sometimes 12 or more, right? So, oh, yes. Yeah. That's we're using our okay. timeout rooms a lot differently than how we used to. Um, timeout used to, to be somewhere that was more of a control um, place for, for the staff to be like, well, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, you need to go to timeout. And so the kids weren't responding well to that, obviously. Now we, we refer to timeout as PTO, you know, personal timeout, because the staff, we have PTO when we need a break from what's going on at work. And so we, we treat the kids in the same aspect. And we have an entire phase system that includes different type of coping skills that can be used down in the timeout rooms. Our timeout rooms, one looks like the beach and the other one looks like um, the park. They're covered with chalkboard paint. And so the kids can go in there and draw on the walls about whatever was bothering them. Um, they can draw fish, they can sit in there for therapy sessions, and so we try to encourage our therapists to use those rooms for more therapeutic approaches so that when a child is becoming frustrated, uh, wherever they are within our facility, that that is a place that they can safely go and get away from the thing that is causing frustration. Terrific. So I see on this slide that you, you have uh, showing that morale has gone up. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Or? Yeah, um, I feel like the morale has gone up because not only are they not getting injured anymore, but like I said before, they're, they're not treated as babysitters. Our staff mm -hmm. have always, in the past, they felt like 
they were just told what to do. This is how you need to interact with a, a child. Your input does not matter. You are there to serve them, to serve us, and to put them in a restraint if they become too aggressive. Now they're more aware of what's going on behind closed doors with the therapist. Now we might not go into detail about the ins and outs of what's discussed in therapy sessions, but they know specifically the goals that we're, we're working towards. Um, they know how we're measuring those goals. And so whenever they're interacting with the kids on a day-to-day -day basis, let's say for instance, a, an objective is we'll utilize three coping skills um, effectively to, to manage anger then they're marking on those point sheets our progress notes that, okay, this consumer used that coping skill appropriately. So they're, ju they're just more involved in the treatment process, so they feel like they have more of a purpose. That's and true. So that they, That's true. Rather than having to control the consumer, they're more involved with the progress. And I think that makes a huge difference in how you treat the students. Wonderful. So for both of your organizations, you've already achieved so much. And actually, if, if you really think about when you think about culture change or taking on an initiative like this, you know, normally we, we use a metaphor here um, that, you know, ship, big ships turn slow. Um, you just can't turn on a dime just like you can't change a culture on a dime. But I have to say for both of your organizations, you've made some big changes fairly quickly when you, you look at time frame. So what's next um, for both of you? Veronica, like, what is your vision for autism services in the future? Well, um, as we have been um, uh, trying to do uh, is to pay attention to uh, our folks and their interests. We really shift, have shifted and are paying better attention to what they're interested in and in offering um, opportunities for them to be involved in things that are of interest to them. And sometimes it's a challenge to identify that. Um, the other thing we do is, you know, when a, when a child has, um, is having a, a, a challenging day, we do a lot of debriefing, um, get the staff together, you know, what went wrong today, what could we have done differently? Was it that a, a staff person was out? But we also do debriefing when somebody has a good day because, of course, we want to replicate that. So we grab the team together and say, you know, why did it go so well? Why is it that we didn't have, any, have to use any kind of restraints or, or blocking? So well, there's a lot of communication. When you talk about m morale, um, that's the to keep them talking and um, sort of trying to be really creative about um, what to do next really, uh, I think, um, enhances their morale. But for us, you know, in, in terms of the future, I, all I, I really have always cared about is to ensure that we are providing a safe, comfortable, engaging environment, um, that we provide meaningful activities for our folks because they know the difference between busy work and meaningful activities um, that tap into their interests. Uh, and help them to develop uh, new skills. Um, we, we, I hope that we can work to assist our folks in gaining, gaining better control of their behaviors so that they're comfortable and happy rather than us having to control their behaviors. And, and, and ultimately, if, you know, if incidental learning occurs, that's a bonus for us. <laughs> You know, because um, yes, we do put a lot of emphasis on teaching new skills, but um, I think they're fully capable of learning things on their own. And then, um, incidentally, and, and when that happens, it's, we're really excited about those kinds of things. So this is sort of the path that we're taking. Um, we've introduced the arts to them, and it's done amazing things because it gives them uh, those folks who do not have a voice, a voice in a different way through the arts. And um, when they're frustrated about something, uh, they could pick up a piece of canvas and talk about it on canvas and um, be satisfied with, with the outcome of that. So we, we try to be really, um, we're sort of non-traditional in our approach and really take our lead from our folks. And uh, um, we've had a lot of success in doing so. Terrific. Jennifer, what's in store for AltaPoint? 
Well, not only do we aim to continue working towards a restraint free organization, uh, we're working towards a reduction in length of stay and uh, an improvement in the environment. Um, each one of our employees has a purpose and is hired to fulfill that purpose. As an organization, it's important for us to identify each other's strengths um, so we can use those strengths to better serve our consumers. Um, the more involved our staff are in the treatment process, like I've talked about, the more valued they feel. You perform better when you feel valued. Um, better performance equals an improved work environment. So as a result, our focus can then return to the therapeutic process, which can lead to a reduction in length of stay. Um, I also hope that we become more aware of our own history of trauma. I think that everybody has their own experiences, and I, I think that coming into an environment like I work in can trigger some of those past traumatic experiences. And I, and I want our organization to be aware that in going with the universal approach, that means that you're being sensitive to employees' needs as well. Um, so when I talk about identifying employee strengths, you also have to look at their, their, not areas of weakness, but areas where they might be triggered by something that happened in the past. And so you don't necessarily have to, to share that with one another, but just, just know that you, you have personal, personal issues that might come up and, and have the comfort of knowing that you have maybe a tag out word and, um, and being able to switch with another employee and know that they're going to be consistent in the progress that you've worked on with that with that consumer. So I think overall, if we have the universal approach building wide, I think that our treatment of the consumers will be consistent as well. Wonderful. So this has been such a great conversation, and I sure hope that the folks listening uh, found it to be of value. Now, we are starting to get a couple questions coming in. I'd like to remind people uh, that are listening that if you would like to ask a question, well, we are ready to answer. So all you have to do is type your question in on the question pane, and um, we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can. So let's just get started here. We have a question from Jennifer. And the question is, can this be used with adults with high aggress aggression in institutions? Um, I would say if Jennifer or Veronica want to pipe in, you're more than welcome to. I will say, uh, just from, from the Ukuru uh, systems perspective, we actually are training um, the, the system in very large developmental centers in, in various states. Actually, we have a team in Texas as we speak doing some training. Um, this has been proven to be effective both with adults and children. Um, so yes, the answer is yes, for sure. Again, Jennifer and Veronica, if you all want to add anything anything to that? Sure. Um, I, I, I would like... Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's all right. No, no that's fine. Um, I'll start by saying, you know, I don't, I don't work with adults. I work typically with, with children within my facility, but we do have some children who are rather large <laughs> in our adult size, and it does it does work with them. Um, actually, our, our more difficult students to work with are the babies, the, the small ones, the, the kindergartners, because, you know, doing a, a safe term, which is part of our training that we go through with Grafton, you know, you've, you've got, they're, they're a lot shorter, so you've got to accommodate for their height. So, in my opinion, I feel like the adults are not as challenging as the, the younger ones. Um, I would like to share something. Yeah, we work with adults as well, and our first um, actually, when we started the supportive blocking, which again was um, what we came away with after our first co conversation with you, Kim, um, we decided to take um, our most uh, challenging adult and, uh, and try this out. Um, and this was a person that I will tell you was a big guy uh, and was in a four-person supine for four uh, four hours out of his six-hour day, on and off. Uh, so most of the time, he was on the floor in restraints. Uh, extremely aggressive, uh, extreme OCD. So, I mean, if you said the wrong thing or you looked the wrong way, 
um, there was a lot of aggression uh, towards people. So we started with the most difficult person, and along the way, with the introduction of the supportive blocking, you know, we learned we learned how to adapt, how to adjust. We did a lot of the debriefings that I talked about. While it was a, a you know a challenging day for this person today, but the next day it wasn't. And why? What did we do differently? Of course, we had a uh, positive support plan in place to go along with it as well. Um, and one of the th one of the challenges was that it was extremely exhausting for staff um, because we had to keep um, moving people around uh, and a good number of people. We had to use a lot of people uh, in the first stages of it. But well, I think once he realized that we were not going to concede um, and uh, put him in restraints, um, he sort of uh, you know, lessened up a bit. Uh, we got to the and it took many, many months um, but I'm happy to say, after um, a consistent approach of using the supportive blocking or the same thing that you we do with Ukeru, he is now restraint-free, walks about his environment. He has his own room that he works in because um, he doesn't like to be in with others. He's very uh, hypersensitive to noises and activities. But he, um, we haven't had to use a restraint in, in probably a year and a half on him. And um, so that, that sort of um, uh, bought us to believe that if we, could, if we could work with him and get him to be a happier person in his environment, that we could do it with anybody. So um, I will say yes, uh, but it takes a lot of consistency, a lot of support, um, a lot of teamwork and effort on everybody's part to make it work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think you really you really touched on something that I think we feel as well is very important. It's just the persistence, um, and I know Jennifer mentioned earlier the, uh, the the desire and the willingness to be creative and to maybe do some things that you weren't necessarily taught in school or in college. You know how you should be doing things to really think outside the box. Um, and, and to do that as a team and, and supporting each other, I think, you know, regardless of the intensity of the behavior, together we can, we can figure things out. Um, yeah. Another question that we have here is how is this approach different from behavior intervention? So either one of our panelists well, like to take uh, that away? I think when I think of behavior intervention, I, f I think of getting in there and doing something. Um, when I think of Ukero, I think of um, preventing having to intervene, <laughs> having to, get, you know, by, by um, really getting to know the person, uh, the triggers, um, and possibly, you know, what trauma events occurred. Uh, what to be sensitive to, because especially our population has a lot of hypersensitivity sensitivities, and you know, in their whole sensory system. Um, but I, I, I would say that this is this is all about avoiding intervention, as I would define intervention. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I'll say that you know, whenever you said avoiding intervention and. When I think of the word behavior, behavior is something that we're, we all do. Behavior is not a bad thing. Um, so we want our kids to behave. We just we want them to make smart choices with their behavior. So with this model, we're working along with them um, and helping them develop healthy choices, getting to know their, their strengths and, and what works with them uh, personally, just like you were talking about. Um, and being creative and figuring out the best approach to working with them, not intervening to to change them and make them stop behaving. We don't want that. We just want them to look at things from a different perspective. Yeah, and I, I'd like to say that, you know, giving control back to them is really key. Exactly. The, the, the gentleman I spoke about earlier, you know, Unfortunately, inadvertently, we were reinforcing a lot of the, the, the supine interventions because he wanted deep pressure. He wanted us to hold him down. 
Uh, and when we realized that that's what was happening and started to back off uh, through the support of blocking, um, he, be, of course, he had this burst of, uh, you know, extinction. And uh, so we had to really be careful and pay good attention to that. But we did get him to the point where if he wanted us to hold him in any way, he could ask for it. And at the very end of the, the phase of where we completely uh, did away with any kind of um, hands-on, he could come up to somebody and say, hold me. And he would lay on the floor by himself, and we would get on the floor, and with no, no um, strength behind it, or um, we would put our hands where we typically would for a restraint until he was ready to get up, and he'd get up. But we weren't holding him down. He was down on his own. But he was able, what we were trying to reinforce was the fact that you can ask for that and get it. You don't have to act out to get it or, you know, become aggressive um, if that's what you want out of people. So um, I think you have to be really sensitive to the function of what's behind that behavior. What's it serving? If it's deep pressure, then we need to give deep pressure in a, in a more acceptable fashion. Okay, so it looks like we have more and more questions coming in. I'm not sure we're going to have time to get through all of them. Um, but again, if you have questions, feel free to type them in there. What we're doing is we have a person who is jotting all the questions down, and then we will actually get those answered um, and post them. So one of two questions are coming up. So does this type of system work for individuals who may bang their head? And then there was also a question about, well, what about individuals who may get in fights with each other. Um, I can tell you we have techniques that we teach for both. So we do have blocking techniques um, that we teach for you, uh, those who bang their head. Um, again, we are not holding their head or doing anything like that to restrain or immobilize them. What we're, we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we are using equipment that is nice and soft so that that's what they're banging their head into to make sure that no one's being injured. Um, as far as fights, um, I think our panelists had mentioned there's a technique that we're teaching called safe turn that is not a restraint. That's um, something that we use that and blocking in combination in order to get folks away from each other um, to keep everyone safe that we, we have found to be very effective. Now, again, I feel like in many times with the, the questions and then our answers, we tend to lean toward the blocking techniques. The blocking techniques are probably less than, or probably about 40% of the training that we do or less. Um, don't forget what we started out talking about earlier, comfort versus control. Um, we also teach some uh, techniques around conflict management, uh, you know, conflict and um, mediation. We talk about communication. We talk about the boiling point um, and being able to identify signs of uh, someone is is going into crisis or is are already made it to crisis. Um, so again, there's a lot of other things that we teach that we really want to sort of eventually rest on, and and those are the the non-physical things. Now, again. All of us here at Ukuru, as a part of Grafton, we do this work every day. So we, do, we, we never want to lose sight that there are some times that my words are not enough. Um, I've been in situations myself where I've done my very best to de-escalate non-physically, and it's not working. Um, and so that's why we want to substitute the blocking techniques for the use of restraint and seclusion. So, you know, really, any incident that you can think of where you would typically use a restraint, we we now use blocking. Um, again, maybe I we'll think have... He, uh, mm -hmm. One other thing, as you talk about this, Kim, um, I always think of the environment and how uh, the environment um, is so key in dealing with some of these challenges, and maybe just readjusting the environment will, you know, um, uh, change a, a crisis situation. So, and it's it's the easiest thing to do, really. It's at our fingertips to change the environment. 
Yeah, so, and I want to piggyback on what you were talking about mm -hmm. with the the um, the boiling point because we use mm -hmm. that a lot within our facility. We have um, visual displays all over the building, it, not only for the the kids to see, and and we have them by our our timeout rooms. And actually, our youngest group they made their own boiling points with their own choice of colors, and so they're able to tell us, you know, I'm at red. Um, and so we have one by the, the timeout room, and so we can ask them without using, you know, talking too much. If we know that they are frustrated or agitated, we can say, what color are you at? It's quick, it's easy, and they can say what color they're at. Um, so we, then we have a separate boiling point that shows how the staff should interact with that child based off of what color they are on, on the boiling point. So our staff who are not trainers, who, who aren't exposed to this as often as someone like I am, they can refer back to those posters and know, okay, well, they're at yellow. This is what I'm supposed to do when they're at yellow. Wow, that's wonderful. That, that's a great example. So I really want to be sensitive to everyone's busy schedules, and we've passed our 3 o'clock um, end time here. So just to, to bring us together and conclude this, I, I again, I cannot thank enough Jennifer and Veronica for providing us with such great information. Um, actually, I, I thank you for being partners with us. So again, thank you so much for the presentation. It's been our and pleasure. For the fine work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you again, for bringing such an awesome. Thank you for bringing such a wonderful program to us, really. Yes, I, I second that. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to just remind everyone, again, we're going to get these questions answered for you and we'll get those posted. We will also be posting this presentation um, on the ukrusystems.com website. Um, I think we also send it out to everyone who uh, attended. Um, but I also want to make sure that folks are aware we have our next free webinar that will be on April 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, this one we're looking forward to as well. It's the importance of trauma-informed care and it's a parent's perspective. So we have parents as our panelists. Um, please stay in touch in between webinars. Um, you can use the hashtag, uh, hashtag starts with you on Twitter. And also, again, if you're interested, feel free to go to our website and sign up for our newsletter. Always some cool stuff in there. Um, again, you'll also, again, with that email that you're going to receive from us, it's going to talk about how you can uh, view this archive webinar as well as get CE, a CEU if you need to do that. So we'll be sending that to you. So on behalf of Ukuru Systems and Grafton um, and our presenters, thank you once again for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful rest.